Good morning, and welcome to our live broadcast at First Presbyterian. It is a joy to come into your home today with good news about God who loves you. If you're ever in Uptown Columbus, we invite you to stop by and say hello. We'd love to see you, have you worship with us. We'll make you feel like family. At First Presbyterian, we are family. Learning together, growing together, worshiping together. called to worship by the lighting of the Advent Candle of Hope by members of our youth mission team who went to Chattanooga this summer. Today we light the first Advent Candle, the Candle of Hope. It stands for hope based on deep conviction, not wishful thinking. We lived in hope this summer as we served the widows in Chattanooga. We lived in hope as we worshiped and as we worked in your name. The prophet spoke of the day when people from all nations would come together to work for God's kingdom. That vision of hope in tomorrow sustains for the work in front of us today. We light this candle of hope with confidence and love. Isaiah 9:2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness on them, the light has shined. Let us pray. O oh God, you never sleep. You watch with infinite care over your children across the sea and across the street. Keep us from growing weary in waiting for your love, lest we miss the glory of your appearing. Keep us from growing cynical, lest we miss your hope for our lives. O Christ, awaken us to live today as children of the light and hope. As we pray for ourselves, we pray for those we touch and those who touch us with your love and mercy. Even so, Come quickly to our lives and world. Amen.
please be seated. If anyone sins, we have someone who pleads with the Father on our behalf, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. And Christ himself is the means by which our sins are forgiven. Let us confess our sins before God and one another with our prayer in our bulletin. Most holy and merciful Father, we acknowledge and confess before thee our sinful nature prone to evil and slothful in good and all our shortcomings and offenses. Thou alone knowest how often we have sinned and wandering from thy ways and wasting thy gifts and forgetting thy love. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us who are ashamed and sorry for all wherein we have displeased thee. Teach us to hate our errors, cleanse us from our secret faults, and forgive our sins for the sake of thy dear Son. And O most holy and loving Father, help us, we beseech thee, to live in thy light and walk in thy ways according to the commandments of Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep, the good shepherd who came that they may have life and might have it abundantly. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus down, you guys. Hey. Good morning. Oh, thank you, darling. Have a seat, okay? Where is everybody? I don't know, Liza. Where is everybody? Here comes some more friends. Right. We do have some friends who aren't here today. Why do you think that is? They're on vacation, yeah. Well, we just had a big holiday, didn't we? Did everybody have a super Thanksgiving? Okay. Well, I can't wait to hear all about it. We're going to talk about it when we get upstairs. Okay? So does anybody know what today is? It's a pretty big day in our church calendar. What is it? It's, it is almost Christmas. Today is the first day of December, which is Advent. It's time for Advent. And the word Advent means what? Walker, you've been listening? What's it mean? To, to be excited to wait for something. Yes. To anticipate. We do get presents at Christmas time. Well, I was thinking about that. It's funny that you mentioned that. Because when I was talking to God about what I would talk to you about today, he put something on my mind that I want to share with you. Who loves to listen to Christmas music? I do. I love Christmas music. But Henry and I, my son, we made a deal, because he rides in the car with me quite a bit, that we wouldn't listen to Christmas music until after Thanksgiving. 
because, you know, sometimes when you start listening to it too early, by the time Christmas rolls around, you're not really in the spirit anymore, right? Well, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite Christmas songs is The Little Drummer Boy. Who knows that one? You know The Little Drummer Boy? Yes. Well, when I was a little girl, and this is kind of embarrassing, but I'm going to tell you anyway, I used to listen to the old version of The Little Drummer Boy. They play it on the radio now but it was the choir and they were singing the song and I would put a blue blanket over my head and I would pretend like I was Mary and I would walk around my room and I would do the whole, act out the whole thing by myself because I love that song so much. You know what I love about it? Tell me, does anybody know the story of the little drummer boy? He was a poor boy. He lived in the city where Jesus was being born and he was a very poor young man. He didn't have a lot of stuff did he? But he was anticipating and waiting and excited about what was about to happen, about the newborn king. And he was thinking to himself, what can I possibly give someone so grand as the king? And he saw all the people coming and wanting to be excited about the birth, and he saw the three kings come with their fancy gifts. You know, they had the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh, which we'll talk about what all those things are when we get upstairs. But he didn't have anything. He only had one thing, and it was something that God had given him, and he wanted to use that to glorify the new, the new king. Do you guys know what it was? A drum. He could play the drum. God had given him the talent to play the drum. And so the story tells how he went into the stable where Jesus was being born. Now, was Jesus born in a big golden castle? No. It was very humble. There was hay, and there were animals, and it was just donkeys there were donkeys there all kinds of animals around and it probably didn't smell very good because you know what a barn smells like that's basically what it was not real great right so the drummer boy walks up and he says you know what i'm a poor boy just like you i don't have a lot of stuff to give you but i tell you what i can do i can play my drum very softly for you and then do you guys know what he says do you remember Pa pum pum and then what is what happens? What does Jesus do? The baby looks at the drummer boy and what's he do? Do you remember? It says, Then he smiled at me. So even his most humble gift, the humble gift of sharing his talent and playing for him, was enough for Jesus. So my goal for you guys during this Advent and as we lead up to Christmas, we all love presents. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? It's exciting. I get it, right? I get it. But let's keep in mind the simple things that God's given us and let's use our talents and gifts to glorify him by sharing with others this season, okay? We're going to talk a lot about this over the next 24 days leading up, okay? Well, let's pray about it and we're going to go upstairs and I want to hear all your stories of Thanksgiving. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending us your Son, our Savior, to save our lives, to die on the cross for us. Lord, we thank you for Mary and Joseph. What a sacrifice to know that your child would be born to die for you. Lord, we are so grateful and so thankful for all the bounty in our lives. Thank you for a wonderful holiday. Thank you for these children and the members of this congregation. Lord, I ask that you will continue to find favor over all of those here and those who are not with us today. Lord Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's line up. Almighty, gracious, and loving God, as we once again hear your word read, may it convict us of where we fall short. May it show us a better way to live. And may we have a vision of your holiness in Jesus' name. Amen. By those who are able to please stand for our first lesson, comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. And listen now to the Word of God. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for our sakes He became poor, so that by His poverty you might become rich. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Those who are able are invited to stand for the second lesson, which comes to us from the Old Testament, the book of 1 Kings in the third chapter. Listen for God's word speak to your life today. Reading from the New International Version. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace in the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because the temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense in the high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, The Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. And now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have have asked for death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give what you have not asked for, for both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon awoke 
and he realized it. It had been a dream. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. It's a question that we typically ask of children. What do you want for Christmas? If we ask a child, they could tell us with great clarity and detail exactly what it is that they want. Some with a very long list. But what is it that you want for Christmas? Is Christmas a time when you even hope or dream or ask for anything, material or otherwise? What is the desire of your heart? What is a deep yearning? What is a passion, a need, a request for this Christmas, this season of miracles? Speaking of miracles, the sermon title is All I Want for Christmas. And if your answer for all you want for Christmas was to beat Bama or to beat Georgia Tech, this sermon may not apply to you because your Christmas wish has already come true. Your prayers have been answered. Merry Christmas. God has been more than gracious to you. You better not ask for a national championship. How could you ask for more? More than a a 109-yard return on a missed field goal with no time left on the clock? Or for a victory after a 20 to nothing start, pulling out a victory in double overtime? So give Santa a break this year. Thank God and be humble. Now, it may not seem like all this football talk has anything at all to do with the sermon, the season of Advent in which we find ourselves, or the story of God's faithfulness that we are following in these days and days to come. But I believe God will speak to us. God will speak to us from His Word, His living Word, where we live. God will speak a unique word to our lives today regardless of which team we pull for in football or whether we care care at all about football. God desires to give us a word. So let us pray. Dear loving and gracious God, present here by your living and powerful Holy Spirit, despite all the excitement of the weekend, of football games, of travel, Despite all the dynamics of Thanksgiving and its logistics and families and friends and the joy and challenges of those relationships, despite being so distracted by the plans that we have made or the plans that we have yet to make that are so important to us, we ask that you would settle us, center us, quiet us, speak to us, May it be your voice that we hear. May our hearts be tuned to your voice, and upon hearing it, would you calm the flutter of our hearts, the spinning and the worry of our heads, the restlessness and the fidgeting of our hands. Speak to each of our hearts the word that you know that we need to hear. And give us ears to hear and hearts to understand and surrendered wills to receive and live the truth that you impart to us today. For your glory and for Christ's sake. Amen. First, a word about Advent. The season that has begun with the lighting of the candle. Let us be reminded that Advent is a season of four Sundays that lead up to the celebration of the Incarnation The birth of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, Savior, Messiah, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. These Sundays give us an opportunity to prepare and to anticipate for this celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ, the babe of Bethlehem. But more importantly, the season of Advent 
is an anticipation and a preparation for the return of Jesus Christ, His second coming. There are two Advents that we acknowledge and celebrate and anticipate. The first coming of Jesus is our Savior born in a manger. And the second coming of Jesus as our risen and reigning King. We celebrate both. Advent is a time for us to ask, am I ready? Am I ready for the season? Am I ready for the celebration? Am I ready for Christ's return? How often do you think about the second coming of Jesus? How often is that even a thought in your mind, much less a desire of your heart? Do you think about it multiple times a day, once a day, once a week, maybe once a month, that Jesus might come back at any time, any moment, like He promised that He would do to claim His own and to reestablish His kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? Well, Advent gives us an opportunity to celebrate His coming and anticipate His return. It gives us an opportunity to ask those questions of ourselves. Am I ready for His return? And what is it in my life that I need to be paying attention to? What is it in my life that I may need to change, that I need to confess, that I need to let go of, that I need to embrace? Where is it in my life that I feel empty and have been filling it with temporal things? Where is it in my walk that I need to go deeper to know my Lord and to walk with Him? Advent gives us the opportunity to go deeper. To go deeper in a devotional life, a prayer life. And we have study guides for you, devotional books for you in the narthex, in the gathering hall, daily bread, and a special devotional that follows uh, or, or is published by the story, the people who, who, who uh, produced our study materials for the story. We also have opportunities, Advent lunches on Thursdays. Coming up this Thursday, Reverend Johnny Flakes will be speaking on Christ as prophet. Then Lyle Dorsett from Beeson Divinity School will speak on, on Christ as priest. And then Ron King we thought it would be fitting for Ron King to speak on Jesus Christ as our King, the executive director of the Pastoral Institute. Take advantage of these Advent lunches on Thursdays. Take advantage of the worship opportunities, of lessons and carols, of the tree lighting. Take advantage of opportunities to serve, to carol at the Ralston, to, to pack sack lunches for those who come to our doors Monday through Friday looking for a little sustenance for that day. Avail yourselves to these ways to go deeper into your life of following, of knowing, of serving, of celebrating Jesus Christ. It's the season of Advent. This is also the time when we continue in the story. But just for, one, but just for this week, because we'll take a break in this this journey through Scripture. We'll, we'll, we'll take a break after today, and then we'll pick back up in January. Are you a part of this story? Have you joined a class either on Sundays or midweek? Are you reading through the story? Are you making that a part of your life? It's not too late to become part of this journey. And the story continues today as we look at the life of Solomon the great king of Israel, the, the son of King David, David who ruled over the United Kingdom, David who was a man after God's own heart, yes, with his foibles and his flaws, but a desire to know God with honesty and authenticity. And now we have David's son, Solomon, who comes to the throne. And as David passes the baton to his son, to Solomon, we read this as Randy Frazee writes in his book, The Heart of the Story. As David passes the leadership baton to Solomon, Israel is in great shape. Financially, they are strong and prosperous. No trillion dollar debt hanging over them. And they are at peace. No wars with neighbors in the Middle East to drag down Solomon's popularity rating. If ever there was a time, a good time to be king of Israel, this was it. And this is Solomon's time. 
God approaches Solomon early in his reign and tells him he can have anything that he wants. And Frazee writes, can you imagine what this would be like? Anything you want. God who can provide anything comes and says, whatever you want is yours. No boundaries, no rules. Ask for anything and I will give it to you. An astounding offer is made by God. Anything that you want and I will give it to you. Are you bold enough? Are you courageous enough to ask of God what it is that is stirring in your heart? A latent desire, a deep passion. Would you be bold enough to ask of God what it is God has laid upon your heart for you, for your family, for your friends, for your church, for the world? Solomon, when given this opportunity, asks for wisdom. And he asks in a very humble way, saying, Lord, my God, I know that you blessed my father, and it is you who have given me the place on this throne following my father. But I am not wise enough. I am not smart enough. I am like a mere child. I don't know what I'm doing. I've, got, I've gotten in over my head. So, Lord, what I am asking for is for you to help me. Help me by giving me a discerning heart. Give me wisdom that I may be able to distinguish between good and evil so that I can see the truth and not in grace. Help me divide what is good from what is bad. Give me a discerning heart so that I can rule with justice and help my people prosper. Solomon does not ask so much for himself of this gift of wisdom, but it is for the benefit of the people that he will serve. And God is pleased by what Solomon asks of the Lord. And God imparts to Solomon wisdom. We see that quickly in the story as this request is uh, is made and fulfilled. The story of two prostitutes who come to King Solomon. They appear before him because we are told that the night before, one of the prostitutes in a tragic event smothers her child in the night and awakens to find her child dead. And sleeping nearby is another of her friend with her own child, and she swaps her child who has died with the one who is living. And so the other mother wakes up and finds her child dead, but discovers it is not her child. And so there is a conflict that exists between between the two women. Two mothers and one living child. And they cannot determine who is the mother. And so they bring this, this, this conundrum to the king, and the king listens to the mother's plea for the one that they say is their child. And Solomon says, I know how I will decide this. Bring me a sword. And I will divide the child and give one half to one mother and another half to the other. And the mother who claimed that it was her child and brought the child in her arms said, fine, and we can each have our part. But the other mother says, no, I will relinquish this child to her. Because more important than owning and possessing her child was the life of her child. And Solomon said, this is the mother. Return the child to her. Solomon possessed wisdom beyond any of that day or that time. And people would come from all over the known world to listen to Solomon and the wisdom that he would impart Scripture says that God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand of the seashore. And goes on to say that Solomon spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. And he not only had wisdom to discern good and evil, but he had a breadth of knowledge. And Scripture says he spoke about plant life, about the cedar of Lebanon, and the hyssop that grows out of walls. He also spoke about animals and birds and reptiles and fish. He was a Renaissance man. And from all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. 
And we read of the Proverbs that are recorded in Scripture in the Old Testament in the book of Proverbs that follows the Psalms. They are a tribute to Solomon. And in there he says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. He goes on to write these jewels and drop these pearls to his people, not keeping the wisdom for himself, but so that they might benefit as well as they read and employ. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him, and He will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Give to the Lord of your first fruits. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent His rebuke because the Lord disciplines those He loves as a father, a mother, in the son or the daughter in whom he or she delights. And I said this morning at one of the earlier services looking at the young people there, and I will again today, if your parents are disciplining you, it is because they love you. And if they're not disciplining you, Parents, maybe you should start. One of the mothers between the services, she said, my daughter heard what you said, but I don't think she's buying it. She's not feeling the love. And young people, you may not feel the love for quite some time. It may be a few years before you come around to understand the love and the discipline that your parents impart. Solomon also wrote to his people, it is not one's honor to avoid strife, but every fool is quick to quarrel. Let the righteous lead blameless lives. Blessed are their children after them. Gossip betrays a confidence. So avoid anyone who talks too much. If someone curses their father or mother, their lamp will be snuffed out in pitch darkness. A person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. Do what is right and just. To do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. The Lord, the, the, the wisdom of Solomon is, 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 is given here time and time and time again. In reading back over these Proverbs, one of the things that I realized is that uh, that how we use our mouths is very important. You've heard some of those proverbs here. Another proverb is, even a fool can appear wise if he keeps his mouth shut. Now, this is a freebie, but I want to introduce something to you called the 2-1 principle. This is something that I've come up with and I'm trying to employ in my own life, and I give it to you. If you remember nothing else from this sermon, this may be your tidbit. The two-one principle. Let me ask you this. How many eyes do you have? How many ears do you have? How many hands do you have? How many nostrils do you have? How many mouths do you have? If we live in proportion by using our other senses in proportion to how we use our mouth, two to one, life will look a whole lot different. Listen twice as much as you speak. Use your eyes twice as much as your mouth. Use your hands twice as much as your mouth. Another thing that I'll throw out here for you on the first day of December, in the season of Advent, a month with 31 days. Doesn't December have 31 days? Do you know how many Proverbs there are? 31. A wonderful discipline that you might explore would be to read one proverb, pray through one proverb every day. So today, read proverb one. Tomorrow, read the second chapter, and the third and the fourth, and go all the way through the month of December, praying through the proverbs. It may bless your life. That's the freebie. So Solomon asked for wisdom, and the Lord gave Solomon wisdom. But not only did God give Solomon wisdom, 
He was so pleased in the manner in which Solomon asked for himself and for his people that he said, I will also give to you everything else that you didn't ask for. And what a beautiful picture of the character of God we see in God's generosity. God abounds in goodness and love and blessing and wants to bless His children. Have we asked for any blessing, any gift, and how much more God wants to give to us? And God gave Solomon wealth and honor and a long life and prosperity and peace. Solomon is allowed to build the kingdom, to build the temple. But unfortunately, the story of Solomon's life does not have a happy ending. For when we read on, we see that there is a slow fade. Solomon becomes distracted. His life becomes diluted. He becomes diverted in the manner in which he is following the statutes of the Lord and His decrees and His commands. And Solomon, in all of his comfort, in all of his blessings, he forgets the Lord. How much are we like that even in our own lives? That we have been so blessed, we become so comfortable, we become so self-satisfied and so self-assured that we forget our dependence upon the Lord. Randy Frazee in his book, The Heart of the Story, calls Solomon the frog king. You may have heard the story about frogs. You can throw a frog into a pot of boiling water and he will hop out immediately. I don't know any of one of us that would be led right in directly into sin in our lives and defying God's desires and way for us. But what we know about frogs is that you can put them in room temperature water, place them on a stove, and gradually raise the temperature of that water. And a frog will sit satisfied until the water boils and the creature is dead. It's a slow fade. It's a distraction. It's a delusion. It, it is a wandering away. And we finally come to a place when we, we, we discover ourselves to be somewhere that we never, ever wanted to be. How did I get here? How did this happen? And it happened in Solomon's life. He had collected all of his wealth, and so he began to collect wives, we are told. Wives from foreign nations, and God said, do not marry or intermingle with them and do not worship their gods. But Solomon, we are told, his heart is diverted and he begins to worship the gods of his foreign wives. And it is displeasing, and his story ends in tragedy. What might God be saying to us in this part of his story today? Have we become so self-satisfied and full and comfortable that we do not recognize where we are and where we need to be? Have we lost the ability to see sin in our lives and confess it, and acknowledge it, and ask God to change us? Might it be this Christmas that we would ask God for a discerning heart, that we would ask for wisdom, not more stuff, but that we would ask that God would reveal to us where we need to change and be changed. Might it be the deepest desire of our hearts that we would anticipate and desire the second coming of Christ to say, Jesus, come with those early believers of the church. Come, Lord Jesus, come and truly mean it and to say, Lord, in your coming, change me so that there is nothing in my life that would keep me from you when I see your coming. There is no sin that would block me from you. Help me to see it, confess it, and take it from my life. That I may embrace the fullness of your reign and your kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. This is the season of Advent of celebrating the first advent and anticipating the second advent. Will we be ready to receive Him when He comes? 
Yes, the Lord has given us so much. Dare we ask for more? What is the desire of your heart? What is it that you would want to see happen in your life this Christmas? In the lives of your loved one or your family? In the life of this church? In the life of the world? And how might it be that God would use us to bring it about? For there is a King who is coming. His name is Jesus Christ. And Scripture tells us that it is this same King who left the riches of heaven and was willing for our sakes to become poor so that in His poverty we might know His riches. And He wants to shower us with those blessings and those riches as we anticipate His return, which is sure. And so let us this Advent celebrate the first Advent and pray that we might see and receive our reigning and risen King in His second Advent. And so to that end, will you pray with me, please? O oh, gracious and sovereign Lord, You are good beyond the telling of it, and You have been so good to us, dare we ask for more. You have given us Your very Self and Your Son, Jesus Christ. Yet we pray that we would receive Him afresh. We pray that You would give us humble hearts. We pray that this Advent, that You would allow us to know the difference between evil and good. That You would give, the, give us the wisdom of a discerning heart. And that You would give us willing spirits that desire not our will, but Yours be done. We pray with humble hearts that You would give us a deeper yearning for Your kingdom, for the return of Your reign on earth as it is in heaven, that You would give us by Your grace a willingness to ready ourselves in whatever way we need to be ready for Your return. Return for ourselves, for our family, for our loved ones, for our church, for our nation, for our world. Lord, instill and cultivate a desire within us that we would desire and celebrate aright your first advent, and that we would see and celebrate your second. Make our lives a prayer, we pray, loving God, that we might pray, pray with brothers and sisters of the ages. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Amen. Let us stand and say what it is we believe using the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us join together in prayer. Almighty and gracious God, as we begin our pilgrimage toward Christmas and the child who grew to be our Savior, we come like shepherds, expectant and yearning. We come like the Magi, seeking direction to find your presence. We come because year after year we have heard the promise of angels and been reminded of the gift of love. Help us in these days of Advent to, pre to prepare ourselves so that when the star shines over a stable and the angels sing the good news, we may be ready to receive it because our hearts are open and our spirits are receptive to your leading. Glorious God, you made our world and us and all things to serve you. Now make our world ready for your rule. Surround with your healing presence and comfort those who are ill or recovering or in grief. 
Bring hope and opportunities to those who are unemployed or underemployed, those who hunger for bread and for meaning. Gather up those who are lonely and discouraged and strengthen their spirits. We pray for all the areas around the world that are permeated with chaos and unrest, that you bring soon a time when violence and crying shall end and all your children shall live in peace, honoring one another in freedom, justice, and love. Go before us, O God, drawing us into the future that you have prepared for us. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, how would be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'd like to welcome those of you who are worshiping with us here this morning, either in the sanctuary or at Spring Harbor or via television. I'd like to invite those who are seated in the sanctuary to sign the registration pads that are located at the end of the aisles. And pass those along to those seated next to you. When they reach the end, return them to the origin, making note of those who are seated with you so you may greet each other following the service. While we are passing those along the aisles, I'd like to highlight a few of the announcements. Our Chris Tree lighting service will be this Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. in the gathering hall. If you would like to attend the supper beforehand, please make a reservation using the form in your bulletin or contacting the church office. Our Advent luncheon series begins on Thursday of this week. Details are in the newsletter and in the uh, bulletin. Advent devotions are available in the reception hall and throughout the church. The Christmas market began this Sunday morning. There are opportunities to buy gifts for those in your family and friends by making a donation to those who are mission partners in this local community. Booths are set up in the gathering hall uh, in the church. The Advent Photo a Day experience begins today. There were details in the newsletter. It's an invitation to focus on the themes of Advent by taking a photo um, that connects to the theme of the day and then sharing that photo on uh, the various social networks. Details are in your bulletin, uh, excuse me, in the newsletter. At this point, I'd like to invite up Carrie McCoy. Carrie is the chair of the Stewardship and Finance Committee, and he'll be speaking with us this morning about Remember Your Story. Good morning. Excuse my voice. <clears throat> I'm here on behalf of the uh, Budget, Stewardship, and Finance Committee, the ministry, to give you just a brief update on our, our 2014 Your Story Stewardship Campaign, as well as a brief update on the 2013 budget. God is great and we are blessed. This congregation has a generous spirit and supports many programs, as well as educational opportunities through its annual budget. There's a list of these in your bulletin today of all the different opportunities and uh, things that we support through our uh, giving. Our stewardship of the bounty provided by God has provided many blessings for both people inside and outside of this church. The year to date through 2013, there's in your bulletin, you'll note that we are $3,000, uh, have a $3,000 deficit of income versus expenses. This is a very good position that we find ourselves in as we enter December. Uh, this week, you will receive a uh, letter from the church where they have a statement uh, of giving you a status report on where you are on your pledge. We appreciate that, what you've already done. The 2014 budget cannot be finalized until we have all pledges received, as well as all 2013 pledges collected. We're currently at a campaign goal. We're at 83% of our campaign goal, which is 1,383,000. So we've uh, pledges so far of 1,150,000. And this is through last Wednesday. We have uh, received 183 pledges of, from folks who pledged last year, and those pledges have increased by 7.7%. God is great. We have also received 24 new pledges this year, so God is great. We are, uh, however, we will not be able to complete this part of our story until we have received all of the 2014 pledges, so there are still about 40 pledges we'd like to receive. Um, in conclusion, 
If you have finished your 2013 pledge, thank you. If you have still will pay in December, we thank you. If you've turned in your 2014 pledge, thank you. If you'll turn your pledge in in December, thank you. We appreciate all that you've done, will do, and continue to do for, your, for this story campaign. God is great, and we are blessed. Let us continue to worship God with the presentation of our tithes and our offerings. Gracious God, as we are surrounded by Christmas lights that shine in the darkness, may the tithes and offerings we present to you this morning be lights that shine in the darkness of the world, bringing your light and hope to those in need. Through Christ our Lord, amen.
children of God, go into the world in hope and with peace and love in your hearts and have courage. Stand firm in your faith. Return to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Love and honor everyone, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of His face to shine upon you and give you peace and all God's children peace today and forevermore. Amen.